Yo, have you heard of LinkedIn Learning? If you haven't, LinkedIn Learning is an American massive open online course provider. It provides video courses taught by industry experts in a variety of subjects. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because Living Corporate is in partnership with LinkedIn Learning to provide diversity, equity, and inclusion courses. Listen, if you're trying to be a better ally, you want to understand better diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, or you just want to learn how to be a better leader, you got to check out the courses on LinkedIn Learning. So check it out. You can do it one of two ways. You can click the link in the show notes or you go to LinkedIn Learning and you search Living Corporate. Again, link in the show notes or go to LinkedIn Learning and search Living Corporate. I'll see you over there. Welcome to a special edition of Radical Change, Bonda Page. I am your host and welcome. What we're going to be doing today is really talking about Black History Month. Um, And I'm really talking about Black History Month from the perspective of the experience, what we experience um, as Black people, whether we are um, at work, Um, in corporate America, whether we are students, whether we work in academia, healthcare, whether we are essential workers, we are all going to be experiencing Black History Month in a particular way. Um, The other thing is that I think we all, those of us who live in America, we have common expectations around Black History Month. And, you know, really, um, those expectations are based in part on what we are used to experiencing. And so, you know, depending what part of the country you live in, depending on how rural versus urban versus suburban the area is where you live, if you live in a predominantly uh, white space like I do here in the Pacific Northwest, or maybe if you live somewhere, you know, on the East Coast, like a Philly where I'm from or Baltimore, um, your experience might be different. However, there is, I think, some common experience um, that we have around Black History Month. And it's really um, in the way that it is um, commercialized, the way that corporations and individual people monetize it. And, you know, it's also about um, representation, image, and the story. And so, you know, we are going to um, uh, undoubtedly see some things um, that come up, uh, whether it's, you know, poorly uh, designed, developed or built ads, or, you know, whether it's just some blatant uh, tokenism, right? So for example, if we were to see some companies, you know, touting uh, a bunch of uh, black employees, you know, on their Um, social media when we really know that, you know, most of the black employees work in, uh, you know, maybe the customer service or more entry level positions in an organization. What is the experience, right, of those employees? What is it that they know, right, that's really happening behind closed doors that don't really line up in the uh, Black History Month messages, images, Um, you know, and and propaganda that we're seeing. Um, And when I did the first episode um, on Saturday, you know, um, I thought about it from the standpoint of, you know, how we look at this uh, commemorative month, um, you know, February as being Black History Month and what that significance is. I think one way we experience it is really how the media tells us to experience it, right? How big companies tell us to experience it, how tech uh, shoots out, um, you know, imagery and, uh, you know, algorithms and things to specifically capitalize on Black History Month. So while I think, and, and, you know, being a person who grew up in the um, 70s and and 80s and, and because I had Black teachers, because I grew up, you know, um, in, in um, Black spaces predominantly up until I was 17, I really grew up with a really strong sense of pride, not only in myself, not only in Black people, but not only in looking at Black history from the standpoint of, you know, uh, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and, uh, you know, Malcolm X, but looking at Black history as number one being 
an integral part of American history. Black history is American history, right? America would not be America were it not for Black people. And everyone knows that. However, right, our conditioning, um, the messages that we receive from the media, and all of that, right, all of those things tell us something different, right? All of those things tell us that there has to be a 28 days or maybe 29 every four years designated so that our country, right, so that America can um, recognize the contributions of Black people rather than repairing um, its egregious uh, and atrocious, atrocious behavior, right, against Black people, rather than really um, looking at Black History Month as a time to uh, make advances, right, and to address some of those issues and those problems, uh, you know, and the ongoing challenges that we face, right, Black History Month, in my view, is often used as a way to distract um, from the real concerns that uh, Black Americans have. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting in how we watch companies, right, whether they are big retail chains or tech companies or smaller companies, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, but the bottom line is that Black history is occurring every day. Um, and the way that we could make significant changes and the way we could actually drive right radical change will be really looking at black history from the lens of what that history and our history in this country right what that means for black people so um you know first thing um is i want to talk about um uh a post <laughs> that has been going around um, on LinkedIn. And I think it started from an influencer that's a recruiter on Twitter who uh, talked about um, giving a candidate um, 85,000 because they didn't know that the budget for the position of what was $130,000. So you might be saying, well, okay, um, we heard that story. What does that have to do with Black History Month? And, you know, I am going to tell you what that has to do with Black History Month. Um, first and foremost, can you imagine having to work seven extra months just to earn the same amount as a male coworker? Well, if you're a Black woman in the United States, uh, like me, that's a reality. So according to the U.S. Census, right, on average, Black women were paid 63 percent of what non-Hispanic white men were paid in 2019, right? So that means it takes a black woman typically 19 months to be paid what the average man, white man makes in 12 months, right? That's even worse than the national earnings for the ratio of all women, which is 83%. Now these statistics are found um, on American Association of University Women um, in a report that they did. But then there's also another statistic, right? From the Federal Reserve Board, um, that talks about wealth by ethnicity. And let me tell you some of those numbers. So white households, um, the wealth is $171,000. Latin or Hispanic household, the wealth uh, is $20,720. For the black household, do you want to know what that number is? It's $17,150,000. So first and foremost, right, if you pay all workers um, equally and fairly, then women can support their families just like anybody else, right? And contribute to the overall economy. But black women, right, encounter um, discrimination and, and unfair pay and things like that all the time. So now here was this woman, right, who had a budget of up to $130,000. And maybe this candidate asked for the 85 or the 80 or whatever the number is. But what this person could have done is said, hi, do you know that the range of this job is here? And based on your education, your credentials, your experience, et cetera, you will really fit into this. So I'm going to slate you in at this and take this as a learning that you could always negotiate, blah, 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 right? So 
that's how she should have handled or could have handled the situation. That's number one. The second thing to it is if you think about all of the black women, all of the black people who have been underpaid or discriminated against, even prior to 1619, right? And we worked for free for how long? Okay. So even prior to that, right? Black people have been underpaid, right? So we worked for free, enslaved for more than 400 years, right? Because there's records. Um, and you know, when Columbus got here in 1492, he wasn't just with himself and some white dudes hanging out, okay? So we have worked for free for a long time. And now we're getting underpaid and we're still being underpaid. Um, I read an amazing article written by Janice Gassum today, um, uh, this morning about, you know, DEI, uh, white DEI practitioners, right. Um, that are doing harm in this work. That's black history. So, you know, when I think about like, not only the, the, this, this pay gap, um, when I think about the, um, you know, the way that we, um, as individual people are wielding, uh, you know, white supremacy um, over each other is really, it's really not good. Um, and the reason it happens, though, is really because of this conditioning. And so what I'm going to challenge us to do is think about how we want to experience Black history, right? So I think about we can we can experience Black history from the standpoint of we are Black history, right? Black history in the making, right? And, and history is being made constantly. So we don't have to take um, the time of February 1st to March 1st, 2022 to just say, okay, well, we're going to remember historical or lesser known figures, right? Um, like the one I posted uh, in the image, right? So it's more than that. It's really to me about what are we learning from history and what are we going to do to take it forward? What are we going to do, right, to make it so that black history becomes about black equity and black reparations, right, and black joy, right? We talk about artists and musicians and we feature people and companies do that, right, when they're trying to represent or tell us, right, that they are an advocate or that they are an ally or they are a supporter, right? They might have red, black, and green all up on their websites and on their social media, right? But that experience. So I'm going to ask companies, leaders, individual people, what are you doing about Black history? What are you doing to enhance the experience of Black History Month and showing people what Black history really is? Right. So I think about, you know, starting from the bottom and now we're here. Right. That song. Right. And thinking about the fact that, you know, everybody has come from somewhere and is somewhere and is going somewhere. Right. We all have a journey. And on that journey, we are making history. Now, some of us are documenting that history in things like podcasts and videos and talk shows and being influencers and doing amazing things, getting out your message, your vision and your view. That is black history, right? I think another thing is really from the experience of thinking about it really as a lens of accountability. So knowing, right, what our history is in this country. And when I say our, I mean our collective. I mean the intersectional history of this country, the people, the human beings that make up this country, right? Whether or not we want to admit it, whether or not we feel it, whether or not we believe it, whether or not we've been taught, conditioned, socialized, or trained, we are all connected. And that is the 100. We are all connected. Now, how we relate to those connections, how we um, uh, interact to those connections, that's all a product of who we believe we are, right? That's all a product of our own history, right? Our individual history. 
Now, if you happen to be a black person, damn right, right? Our history is specific and unique in this country. And no one, right, is more capable um, and able to speak to our history, right, um, our experiences, our needs than we are. And so when you think about, right, all of these people that are out here um, that are, you know, talking about the Black experience, that are trying to drive, you know, what they're calling, um, you know, uh, anti-racism education. They are practicing diversity, equity, and inclusion. But what are they actually doing, right, to change the experience? So I'm saying if we frame Black History Month it, within a lens of accountability, right, we can think about it, right? What accountability is owed to Black people? And I'm not even going to go into saying, you know, the basics. I think about Michael Che, the, he's a stand-up comedian who people probably also know from Saturday Night Live. And he has a, a special on Netflix and it's called Michael Che Matters. And he talks about how, how come we can't even say Black Lives Matter. And he says, just matter. Well, I've had, I happen to have been doing a lot of research and study um, over the past, I would say, 14 months in a lot of detail. And one of the things that I've come up uh, to understand about why that phrase Black Lives Matter is so offensive to a majority of um, white people and people who have been conditioned and who grew up in our country, um, it really a lot, when you think about it, it has a lot to do with the way our brains work, right? And the way our amygdala processes danger, right? And so that front part of our, our brain that you hear people talk about as the lizard brain or whatever, right, is only operating to keep us safe. And so the message, right, that um, white skinned, white body people have received for more than 400, 500 years, right, is that black equals danger, you know, black equals bad, black equals dumb, black equals unsafe, black equals all this. Well, we already know all that. That is, right, the story. So I like to say that black history um, is also about stories, right? So that's the story that America has been told about black people. Scary, bad, terrible, dumb, loud. If you're a woman, you're angry. You know, if you're a, a man, you're a criminal, whatever. We know that's the story. So the accountability, right, for America is to change that story, right, based on the treatment and relationship with us, right? So how do you make Black history, right, better? How do you make it so that we're not just talking about you know, um, Claudette Colvin and, and, and Ruby Bridges and Michelle Obama, right? Why we, that's, that's, that's not what we should be talking about. What we should be talking about is what are the actions every day, right? People are taking to do stuff different, right? Because we know what the history is and we know what's happening right now. There are so many amazing people out here doing all kinds of stuff. And if you're like me, you don't have time to read everything. And I like to read um, books um, because I'm a, a really deep thinker. Uh, you know, I started a think tank um, and, and, and it's really important to me to focus on the future. Right. And the future of work, the future of change, um, the, the future of, of, of technology and the way to think about it and that focus of on the future. Right. It has to have a lens of accountability, right? So when I think about Black History Month, I, I can't stop thinking about uh, accountability. And so I think about companies. So if you think about a company, any company, and um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get into it this afternoon um, when I'm, I'm working, uh, doing some research, but what are the companies saying right now? How are they commemorating, observing, celebrating, amplifying Black history or Black people or the messages and contributions versus how are they actually treating Black people in their companies, right? So if you get on Glassdoor or um, any of those other, I can't think of the name of them now because I haven't been on the sites in a while, um, those sites where employees get on 
and they actually talk truth. Um, maybe one site is called Rumor. I don't know why they're all, I'm blanking on them now. But when I think about, you know, those sites that you can get on and you, and they actually talk about people that work there, right? And they say, oh, this manager just got this bonus and they shouldn't have did this. Oh, did you hear about this restructure and blah, 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 right? I mean, you know, when I was working in companies, I was constantly um, on those sites reading to see what the other employees are talking about. Well, right. Are the employees talking about the fact that although the company is doing all of this really good, you know, Black History Month um, promotions and advertisement, how many black people were in the rooms when they had those conversations? How many black people were actually on the team? Right. How many black people really spoke up and said, hey, that's a little racist or, oh, how come you got all able bodied people in this picture? Or, oh, hey, this is a picture of 90 percent dudes who is in the room and is the person in the room. Do they really have authority? Do they really have influence? Do they really have power? Are they just another token? Are they in there sand blowing it up? Right. Like, OK, y'all. Yeah. You know, we're going we're going to bring in these speakers and these speakers and we're going to make really nice T-shirts and we're going to have games and we're going to have trivia and we're going to do all of this. And we're going to make the black people feel like they really um, matter for these 29 days. And then. Keep paying black people the same amount. Keep telling them you're not ready for promotion. Keep telling them that, you know, um, well, your degree isn't really in line with what we're looking for, right? Keep doing the same thing like this recruiter, this talent acquisition person who is giving a person, right, um, way less than what they should have been making. So Foot Locker, exactly, exactly. So this is how a lot of companies are. This is happening all over corporate America. So what I want you to do is tell people to follow Living Corporate, tell people to follow my show um, and others, because these are the things that need to be talked about. And so what I'm going to also tell you, too, is that this is how you can hold your company accountable. So a lot of companies have things like um, internal um, internal message platforms. It could be something like Slack. It could be something like, you know, Microsoft Teams. It could be whatever. You can ask and, and get on these channels and just be like, hey, who was on the committee for Black History Month? As an example, right? But the thing is, you have to remember, or now I don't say you have to remember, something to remember. And I try to uh, remind myself of this every now and then. And what I do uh, when I really need to be reminded about these companies and the fact that they don't care about us is I watch The Wolf of Wall Street, that movie with um, DiCaprio, right? Um, and he basically says, it's all about getting rich. And so when you think about if the number one motivation, right, of these companies is just about getting rich, the way you get rich is through exploitation, right? Period. Of somebody of laws, of rules, of, of your clout, of your relationships, of your connections. That's how it happens. But what I want to say, right, is that we all have the power, right? And what I do, right, what I'm trying to do is bring the conversation out in the street, out in the interwebs, <laughs> right, out here to let people know we can drive change ourselves. We need to understand and be aware of what these companies are doing because we are not powerless. They make us feel powerless. Absolutely, they do. But I have been working in corporate America for 32 years. And because I'm a black woman, right, because I, I mean, I have master's degrees, I have all kinds of credentials and certificates and experience. But a lot of times I sat right in these rooms with these CEOs and these CIOs and these VPs and senior executives and all these people. They're talking about the strategy and what they're trying to accomplish. But the whole time I'm sitting in the room, they don't know I'm taking notes up here and here. And all those notes I took over the past 30 something years in corporate America, I'm giving to the public, <laughs> okay, from the standpoint in how to actually drive radical change. So one of the things I'm going to do, right, is I want to read this a couple of 
when I think about black history, right, and I, t- I, t- I tell you, I think about it from the standpoint is it's not stuff that just everything that happened in the past. It's not all these great heroes and icons that we loved. But one person that is super important to me, and she died recently, um, is Bell Hooks. And one of her books um, where she talks is about practical wisdom, and she talks about teaching critical thinking. And for years, I have said that this is a real problem, right? That people don't apply critical thinking and how they do stuff. And how do you bring, you know, the thought of critical thinking to the market in a way that's not overly pedagogical, that's in a way that people won't call you a professor, right? And tell you that, you know, you always sound like you're teaching people things, right? Um, As I had, I had a a former um, manager tell me, right? It's nothing wrong with being smart, number one. It's nothing wrong with being brilliant, bold, or black, by the way. And one of my favorite songs for Black History Month, and all the time, by the way, though, is called It's Okay to Be Black by Jack Ross. It's one of the best songs ever. Blast that song in the car. You will feel amazing. Blast it in your AirPods, and you will dance around, and you will feel amazing. It's okay to be black, and you will feel amazing. But I want to read a little bit from Bell Hooks. Um, And the first thing I want to do is I want to read from a little foreword in her book. Um, It's actually a quote, right, by Paulo Freire. And it's from um, Learning to Question, a Pedagogy of Liberation. And here's the quote. Human existence, because it came into being through asking questions, is at the root of change in the world. There is a radical element to existence which is the radical act of asking questions. At root, human existence involves surprise, questioning, and risk. And all of this, it involves actions and change. I am all about change. I'm all about it because we cannot, right, continue on this current trajectory. Now, I'm 52. I'm going to be dead in about 53, 54, 55 years from now, right? But other people will not. And I care, right? Not only about my daughter and the next generation and these future generations to come, but I care about the world and the planet. And so I know that things have to change. And so what I'm doing is like, I'm using my experience. I'm using my voice. I'm using my background. I'm using my platform. I'm using my connections, my self to help to drive change. And I think that there's no better time um, for black people, for America in general, all people living here, um, people who care about America, Americans and all humanitarians and feminists, especially, right? Then Black History Month to decide to do something different, to use some critical thinking skills, right? To, To really, um, be involved. And I love that you said you want to be involved um, because, you know, I am doing tons of things um, in this. And so I'm going to send you to um, www.gc. Actually, I'm going to send you right now to um, hello at Radical Change um, real quick. You can just email me there and you're in Delaware. That is where I lived for 15 years, square from Delaware, shouting out. It ain't no problem. I grew up in Philly and we used to be like, if you're not a square from Delaware. And then I lived in Delaware 15, 15 years, um, which I, you know, love. I still have great friends in Delaware. Um, so shout out to Delaware um, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest. And so what I'm trying to do is I want people to have conversations about change, but then actually do stuff. So I'm actually announcing it uh, tomorrow officially. Um, but, um, uh, I am beginning a new initiative where people will be able to join either as a member and a volunteer, but it's actually going to be involved in change and it is all around the future of work. Right. And so when we think about, uh, work, um, and work involves everything, right. Whether we are a student and regardless of the type of work that we do, right. Work. And the future of work is something that we all need to be concerned about. 
So whether you are talking about the future of work based on the impact of um, digital transformation, digital tools and the digital workplace, or whether you are talking about the future of work, because we're talking about workplace accountability, the employee experience and how people are being treated is still a very hot topic that is going to be evergreen, is going to be continuous. And so I put together um, a sustainable think tank where we're going to focus on the future of work and people are going to talk about things about, you know, shared power and the impact of the um, digital transporta- uh, tr- transformation on women. Um, and so this is all happening. You're going to hear more about it tomorrow. But what I want people to do about Black History Month, starting today, right, if you on your way to work, or if you're going to work tomorrow, anytime this week, start doing this. Number one, get on your company's social media. Check out their Instagram, you know, or or their Facebook and, and see what they're saying about Black History Month. Then number two, go in to your internal, um, you know, messaging boards, your intranet or whatever, and see what they're saying inside they're doing about Black History Month. And then number three, get onto some message boards or reach out to your uh, Black ERG or your um, head of inclusion or your director of diversity or your chief people officer and say, hey, I want to know a couple of things. How does what we're saying about Black History Month match up with how we are actually treating black employees? And then what you can do is um, you can send, you know, a message or an email or a memo to somebody in your executive suite. Right. Because if you're a publicly traded company. Right. Which um, I'm sure Foot Locker is. Right. You can um, uh, your your leadership is responsible for um, responding to questions and responding to concerns. So ask some questions and find out and ask how you can get involved, right? And that way you can be a contributor to the Black History Month experience. Okay, so real quick, the third thing I wanna wrap it up is talking about um, exasperation and how Black History Month can be so um, exhausting and it can be so tiring. So first, I think one, if you do work in a company, right, um, where you are seeing one message, but you know actions are different, that can be exhausting. Um, you can give yourself a break from that. And just because it's Black History Month, if you are Black, if you are, you know, an Indigenous person, um, uh, Latin, Hispanic, anywhere in the African diaspora, Black History Month might be too much for you. Because thinking about how we get tokenized and, and, um, uh, and, and, and just really um, exploit it. When you match that up with what you know the reality are, what the realities are, um, that could be, you know, a little traumatic. It could be depressing. It could be hard. So I'm going to say give yourself a break. I talked about this um, in the uh, first episode of this special series, too. But, you know, I have a thing where there's certain things I can't watch. Um, because they just too, they hit me too hard, right? Like I never watch, you know, when a black person, um, you know, gets killed, right? Uh, I never watch, uh, you know, uh, somebody getting dragged out of their car or whatever uh, on purpose. If I ever see those images, it's totally like, oh my goodness, I was at the gym and I walked by the TV and it was on. Um, and so I have that same experience and often similar traumatic experiences when I watch certain shows if they are um, uh, documentaries, right? So like I did, I still to this day haven't watched This Is How They See Us because I can't watch it because I remember, right, uh, that story. Um, and I remember reading about it in the paper. Um, I, it took me three years to watch 13th after it came out. And I had to watch it with my uh, boyfriend at the time. And I just was like, and I only watched it <laughs> because he's white, he was white. And I needed him to watch it. That's the only reason I watched it. So what I'm going to tell you about Black History Month, there's some great um, shows going to be on TV, on streaming services. I mean, all the greats, you know, they constantly making new products, right? The new um, new shows. Tyler Perry constantly making new stuff. Shonda Rhimes, right? All of them. They constantly making beautiful art, beautiful documentaries. If it's too much for you, Black people, You do not have to give yourself more trauma. 
You don't have to give yourself that that trauma because you already know what it is. You live it. I live it. We live it every day. So give yourself a break during Black History Month, right? Um, and if you can find ways to see if you if you know what some of your triggers are, like my triggers are kids or people being hurt, period. Um, so if you know what your triggers are, see if you can find a way to uh, not, not let yourself be uh, triggered or be in that circumstance to be in those triggers. So for example, like I tell you, when I go to the gym, right, you know how they have big TVs on, you know, if, if the TV has news on it, like if I see that it's news, then I try to go to a whole nother area where there is sports on. And hopefully they don't have a lower third with news that's non-sport because I can't handle it. So these are some things that you can do. The other things that you can do, right, to keep yourself feeling exasperated and so, you know, upset because you're like, look, all they're doing a lot of times is, is, is using this as an excuse, right, to not do better and to not treat black people better. You know that. So you know what you can do. And this is something that I do. And this picks me up. Watch black comedy i don't care if it's old dave chappelle you know season one from the chappelle show i don't care if it's michael che i don't care if it's some more watch yourself some black comedy and just get your laugh on right and just embrace that that joy within the midst of pain right and that happiness in the midst of stress and that um, love, right, in the midst of cruelty, right? So embrace that for yourself for Black History Month. That's what I'm going to do. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on everybody right now who I see making Black history. I'm going to focus on my own Black history. Today, I'm starting my uh, TikTok journey. So um, you can follow me on TikTok at Vondiverse um, and think about that uh, verse in a couple of ways, right? verse as the universe of Vonda, right? Because I'm doing a lot of things around the future of work, workplace accountability, um, and Black feminism, right? Um, from the jump. Um, and so the other thing, think of it as verse, because I'm a talker. Um, I was an undergraduate communications major. My master's degree is in communications. I always wanted to be Oprah before I knew who Oprah was, right? And I remember when she came out in, when I was in high school, I was like, oh my goodness. And then life happened and things happened. And so that didn't happen. But guess what? Now life has changed. There's a thing called the internet. There's a thing called streaming. There's an, a, a platform called uh, Crowdcast, and there's a network called Living Corporate. And if this is your first time on Living Corporate, Living Corporate uh, is a media network that focuses on amplifying the voices and experiences of black and brown professionals in the world of work. And today we know that the world of work impacts everybody. Um, and we know that the future of work, I'm going to tell y'all, it's not going to be 40 hours a week. The future of work is not going to be in offices. The future of work is going to be digital, is going to be authentic, and people are not going to be taking this, this treatment the way they are getting treated right now. If you think the great resignation is saying something, if you think all of these people that are leaving corporate America, or you think all of these people that right now is January, people who work for companies that are publicly traded on the stock market, the, the people, the 11% of Americans who have a stock and those who um, work in corporations, they looking at their portfolios right now, trying to see if they can quit their damn jobs. They looking to see if they're going to have enough money on either March 31st, April 1st, April 15th, or April 30th to quit their jobs right now. So if you think in a great resignation, yeah, that picked up in the fall, you know, people are resigning, but what they're really doing is they're not resigning from work. They're resigning to live a different life. They're resigning to be better. They're just, they're resigning to not allow themselves to be continually exploited, right? For their intellectual capital, for their uh, financial future, for their physical health, right? I mean, I talked a couple of weeks ago, um, or maybe it was last year, I don't remember now, about, um, you know, these companies who have let people die, right, at work, right? 
Um, and, and, and we can't be giving up, right, that for other people. And so you got to always have interviews lined up right on. That's what you got to do. You always need to be um, looking at that next level. And I'm going to give you some advice, right? So you think about, like I said, Black History Month, right? And we think about this woman, right, who had this recruiter who had an opportunity to change the financial future of somebody else and, and, and the person didn't do it, right? Why didn't they do it? Did they not do it because they don't make that much money and they thought the person didn't deserve it? Did they not do it because they thought that the person should have known better? Well, here's the thing. It's really hard to know what a company is paying when a company isn't being transparent. So one recommendation is at the very outset, before you spend a lot of time and energy preparing for an interview, looking sharp, you know, double checking and triple checking your interview, your, your stuff. That's right. You research them. But you need to ask the recruiter, what is the range for this job and what are the details regarding the range? So if the salary range, let's say, is from forty to fifty thousand dollars, what is forty thousand dollars versus what is fifty thousand dollars? That's number one. Number two, I'm going to tell you a secret. Women always apply for jobs when we think we've done everything in the, the job uh, description list. Men apply for jobs if they think they can do some things in the list. So what I'm going to tell you is this. When you read that job description, ask yourself, can I do it? If the answer is yes, you apply for that job. If, the, if you ask yourself, have you already done it? You are overqualified for the job. If you read a job description and you have done all of the things, you are overqualified. If you read the description and you think, I haven't done it yet, but yeah, I could do that, you are well qualified for that job and you should ask for the high end of the range. So if the job pays, Forty to fifty thousand dollars. Ask for the fifty. If the job pays seventeen dollars an hour to thirty dollars an hour, ask for the thirty dollars an hour. Ask for the high end of the range. But find out before you waste your time what is the range. I had a uh, I, I talked to somebody about this recently, and I remembered this. Uh, this happened to me like twenty years ago. It might have even been 21 years ago. So I was 31 or 32 years old. And I loved this nonprofit. This was this nonprofit. Oh, and if I say it, you, you'll know it. Is there a great nonprofit in Delaware? I love them. And I wanted to work for them so bad. They wanted me to work for them. I was a volunteer. We went through the whole interview process. They was ready to offer me the job. The title was banging. The responsibilities. And boom. The salary was $35,000 less than my current salary at the time. And I'm telling you, like I said, I have a master's degree. I have a whole bunch of experience. And I was like, oh, my God. I would have taken that job at the heartbeat because it would have been the job of a lifetime. But it was paying too low. So instead, I had to stay at a, at a job, uh, a company that I, I liked. I liked the people. Um, but, you know, the way you get treated as a black woman in corporate America, it is what it is. Right. But, man, if I could have left to work for this nonprofit, I can just imagine, you know, uh, a lot of different things. But I spent weeks in the process and then I couldn't take the job because I couldn't take less than I was already making. I would. And I, I mean, and then they went back and we was talking and talking. And I just remember thinking that was my bad. Because I should have asked them at first. But I just thought because of the title that it automatically was paying what I was making or more. Right. And you have to know your worth. You have to know your worth. Just like, um, you know, I have conversations with people all the time about right about my hourly rate, um, about what I charge for speaking or whatever. And it is what it is um, because I've been in the work field. I've been a, a professional and I know what the range is. Right. Um, and so even though it might sound 
high or it might sound, you know, like it doesn't make sense or whatever, right? You have to know your worth, but you also, right, can use resources like the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can also use um, Glassdoor and other uh, pay scale um, salary.com. There used to be, I'm sorry, I'm not up on the, the hip um, and I'll ask my team to do me some research on this on the good sources now because I haven't looked for a job in a long time, but where you can get the data around what a role like that should play, should pay. However, it should be up to the talent acquisition person, um, recruiter, they should tell you. So um, Glassdoor for sure, but definitely, right, uh, find out what these salary ranges are. And if they don't want to give you the salary range, okay, that is a key. If you apply for a job, uh, and they don't want to give you the range of the salary, that's a key and a clue to how your experience with this employer is going to be. That means they're going to be secretive about everything. That means they're going to uh, gaslight you um, and, and exploit you, okay, if they were not willing to tell you the salary. Why wouldn't they tell you the salary, right? If you can get on Bureau of Labor Statistics and um, look up how much does it cost or, or what is the salary for a manager of, you know, uh, of uh, 12 people in this part of the country or whatever, right? And then you see, and they're telling you something different. So these are all clues, right? So once again, Wolf of Wall Street, all these companies want to do is make money. They don't even care if stuff works, right? And um, I talked a, a couple of weeks ago with some people. Um, we have about four more weeks left, five more weeks left. If you uh, have used Zoom, um, video conferencing from 2016 to 2021, right? Uh, there is a major uh, class action settlement and Zoom owes basically everyone $25. Um, some people, they only owe 15, but depending on um, your uh, use of Zoom and what kind of subscription you had to them, um, because of legal privacy violations um, and them collecting data without letting us know and some other things, they owe all of us $25. Can you imagine if 10, 20, 30, or 50 million people, however many people use Zoom, right? We have 326 million people here in America, right? How many people use Zoom? If we all got our $25 back from them, if, if we all got $25 back from them, that would send some of a message, right? So go to, um, I think it's www.zoomvideocommunications.classsettlement um, or something. I'm going to pull it up. Um, and, and, and pop it in here for you later. But just imagine. So back to radical change, black to, back to black history, right? We are black history. And the way to not be exasperated, right, is to use your power, right? So stay tuned for more. Um, watch out and see what these companies are doing. Um, take careful note. Speak about it. Speak on it. Know that these companies do not own your social media profile. They do not own your mouth. Um, and so you are more than entitled um, and able and allowed to speak up, ask questions, hold power to account, because that really is how we are going to drive radical change. So, hey, um, it's OK to be black. Um, it's, it's beautiful to be young, gifted in black. Um, Pop some beautiful black music in, watch some black comedy, look at some black art, um, you know, delve into some of these black creative uh, projects, but guard yourself, right? Take Black History Month as a time for you to take care of yourself, right? And to think about the history that you're making today and tomorrow, and you tell the story and we will tell our stories. So that way, the experience of Black History Month can be the experience that we want it to be. Filled with Black joy, filled with Black love, filled with Black power, filled with you. So thank you so much for joining. Be safe and everybody take care and I'll talk to you soon.